As an artist with a strong social practice, I spend a great deal of time thinking about how to make art that is accessible, physically, financially, culturally. Art that is meaningful, visually compelling, that sparks conversation and reflection. Years ago, I remember hearing Ivan Sagoda, veteran performing arts manager in New York, remark that if someone sees a contemporary dance performance they don't like, they tend to write off the whole genre and just say, oh, dance is not for me. But nobody goes to a bad movie and says, I'm never going to the movie theater again. Similarly, people will support a sports team for years, even if that team loses all the time. So I started thinking about the appeal of sports and imagining if the same thing could ha exist in the arts. Right now, imagine if all of us gathered in this auditorium and there was on this side Team Antoni, and over here there was Team Ligon, and in the middle was Team Chem, and everyone had their pennants and foam fingers, and we were really pumped up for art. And instead of a nice quiet lunch in the cafe, there was a tailgate party with music and people grilling out front of the NGA. So that's essentially what I did with a piece called Race Talkanash. It's a multidisciplinary performance about gentrification staged as a sporting event. And it took place at the Central Library in DC during open library hours. As part of the research, I hosted a series of community arts workshops in library branches and also an upscale retail space in the very gentrified Shaw neighborhood. From past experience, I know it's very difficult to get people to talk about race and class and to be honest. Instead, we frame the conversation around, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? We also shared experiences of being welcomed, especially by someone who appeared different from us in some way. During the workshop, we wood burned welcome signs and people were encouraged to place them around their neighborhoods. For the performance, we started off with the tailgate party with an actual pickup truck parked outside of the library entrance. There was free popcorn and snow cones, music, and people getting their faces striped and the team colors. I had arranged for a team of what I call super fans to strike up, strike up conversations with people about their experience in DC. So we didn't say, what are your thoughts on gentrification? It was more like, what neighborhood do you live in? Oh, you're new to the city, or oh, you've been here your whole life. People wrote written responses with the hashtag MyDCIs, and we posted those pictures on social media. And right now, I'd like to show um, the first two minutes of the video. And this is obviously edited, but we actually run in slow motion for the first five minutes, five or six minutes of the piece. And people watched it. And there were live commentators. Art auctions. <laughs> 
So this last image shows um, the workout mats that um, they were cut into maps of DC showing the change in racial demographics from 1990 to 2010. So that little red heart is actually Chinatown in DC and then you see by 2010 there's not and there's no longer a critical mass of Asian Americans living in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and one of the things we were really proud of, uh, D.C. has about a dozen different poli police agencies, including library police. And one by one, all of the library police moved from the outside desk to the inside desk and watched the performance. So that's how we knew we were really successful. The audience evaluation wasn't a survey with staffers holding clipboards or iPads saying, tell me about your experience today, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's not the most innovative approach for spaces that are literally dedicated to creative expression. And although I did have a couple of meetings with a really great uh, consultant who, who helped us design integrated evaluation tools that functioned as part of the artistic practice, I really drew on my own experiences and those of my collaborators. So assessment doesn't always have to draw on huge resources and outside entities. We all carry a lot of knowledge within us that we can share and build on. One could argue that a library is a community space and not an art space. And by that same logic, one could argue that a museum is not a space for community. It's a space for art objects. And as absurd as that sounds, many museums operate from this point of view, tacitly or otherwise. We know this. We also kind of know why. If we reflect on the development of American public museums over the last century, it's closely linked to the creation of the major foundations. Foundations are wonderful, and but altruism aside, a key impetus for the creation of many of these foundations is the preservation of generational wealth and with that, the propagating of the cultural values of wealthy elites. There was a time when art museums took more of a leading role in shaping culture, but as our country's demographics evolve and our cultural needs shift, often what we see now is that the philanthropic sector will respond to these changing needs and then push cultural institutions to adapt and change. It's un uncomfortable, but necessary. In DC, we're fortunate to have excellent museums that are free, they are wheelchair accessible, they are close to public transportation, but there are still invisible barriers, what I would call legacy barriers. And I love art spaces, and what I'm about to say is not a diss on any particular museum, um, but thinking about the National Portrait Gallery, which does really excellent public programming, particularly in its atrium space. Um, this is uh, the steps on 7th Street, and on weekends at night when it's warm, you'll see dozens of teenagers hanging out on the steps. And I've always been really curious to know how many of these teens have been inside the museum. Clearly, they can get to it, so that's not an issue. But do they bother to go in it? Also, this isn't something that only affects well-funded white marble institutions. The Anacostia Arts Center, great community art space in a predominantly black neighborhood. It has large windows, brightly colored signage. There's a sandwich board next to the door that says, we're open, check us out. And yet, on several occasions as I've entered, someone from the neighborhood has asked me if it's okay for them to go inside. And again, I'm just really struck by that dynamic. A major museum on the mall uh, recently did a radical thing. They sent a handful of staffers outside to the, ask the public a very simple question, what do you think this building is? The top answer, a bank. <laughs> I'm thinking about what needs to change from an institutional point of view. What we as arts professionals can do, it's not enough to have free or low cost entry. We need to extend an invitation to folks who haven't felt like these public amenities are for them. We have to go outside, figuratively and literally. We have to let go of our elitism. The culture of welcoming has to exist in every facet of the institution. A curator is not necessarily more important than a docent or a guard. 
We also have to let go of the idea that engaging audiences and welcoming community means dumbing down our programming or lowering the standards of the institution. That's false. And it's a really dangerous myth that's used to perpetuate old attitudes. One way we can do this is to invite artists who have experience with specific communities to not only create new work, but to share their expertise and innovation with various departments outside of education and curatorial. So maybe the docent teams or the marketing staff, for example. So this cross-department, cross-disciplinary approach to bridge the silos that often exist in larger institutions. For the past couple of weeks, I have, along with a team of amazing NGA staff, collected personal stories of the American experience from the public. We went to a library, a public high school, and a farmer's market to gather cultural preserves. And this Sunday, the result of this off-site engagement will be presented in a culminating performance. So in closing, I would like to extend an invitation to you. As we leave the auditorium, there, there will be clipboards, beautiful paper, and some mason jars at the top of the stairs on the table where also the evaluation forms will be very important. Um, and we would love to learn about your American experience. It only takes just a few minutes of your time, if you're willing. I'd also like you to come back to the National Gallery on Sunday afternoon to hear the stories performed with our community chorus and live musicians. And if you're feeling really inspired, there's actually still room for one or two more people to participate. No previous performance experience necessary, just a willingness to be part of a community of new people and to literally allow your voice to be heard. I do hope that you'll join us and accept the invitation. Thank you very much.